Situated at the critical junction between the Euphrates and Tigris rivers, Baghdad was a bustling epicenter of research, commerce and culture. The medieval city, just now earning the title of the Caliphate's capital, attracted the brightest and most prestigious scientists and scholars in the known world, representing every major religion and belief system, communicating in almost every major language spoken at the time. In the 820s, one such scholar, a young Al-Kindi, travelled to the famed capital to complete his studies of Islamic law, philosophy and logic. His time spent and experiences gained in the medieval multicultural metropolis would ultimately set the foundations for a diverse and eventful scholarly career. Exploring, in lustrous prose, disciplines as disparate as meteorology to music, what Al-Kindi left for those who succeeded him was a rich and varied canon of philosophical and scientific insights, all of which would inspire more specialised experts in Al-Kindi's varied areas of interest to iterate and advance his inventive ideas into more complete theories. It is through this role, as the inaugural pioneer of philosophical thought in the medieval Arab world, that Al-Kindi earned his now synonymous title as the father of Arab philosophy. Born and raised in the Abbasid Caliphate's former capital, Kufa, in the year 800 of the Common Era, Al-Kindi's father, Ishaq bin Sabah, the governor of Kufa, afforded his son many opportunities and connections. Al-Kindi, like many other medieval philosophers, scientists and academics, was a child of enormous wealth and privilege, with his family heritage affording him even more prestige, tracing back to the reputable Kinda tribe. Facilitated by both his privilege and undeniable talent, Al-Kindi experienced a rapid rise in the ranks of the Abbasid Caliphate, where he prospered under three caliphs, namely Al-Ma'mun, Al-Mu'tasim and Al-Wafiq, the former of which appointed Al-Kindi in the position of the head of the Bayt al-Hikmah, or the House of Wisdom, an intellectual multidisciplinary institution which doubled both as a forum for free discussion and state-funded research projects. Al-Kindi additionally became the personal tutor of the caliph Al-Mu'tasim's son. Unfortunately, he would suffer under the policies of the fourth caliph, Mutawakkil, who targeted many philosophers and non-traditionalists. While not much is known about Al-Kindi, the man, there do exist a few accounts of his character. For instance, he is said to have had a great fondness for numbers and mathematics, frequently attempting to quantify abstract concepts such as beauty, poetry and music. A few accounts also describe him as miserly and thrifty, labels not uncommon to the elites of the time. The majority of Al-Kindi's works were lost throughout history, yet approximately 242 of his texts survived. Al-Kindi's first major contribution involved overseeing the mass translation of works in The House of Wisdom and writing a plethora of commentaries on the works of the ancients. He and his colleagues would have routinely discussed and debated upon these for hours. His frequent contact with Greek works, especially those of Aristotle, allowed him to become familiarised with the philosophical rational process that is, the use of objective principles built on self-evident premises to extrapolate conclusions about reality. If these core principles contradict each other, either in essence or in outcome, then they would be, in objective terms, erroneous. This mechanism of using core presupposed principles to arrive at truths about reality is known in logic as deduction, and while deduction as an instrument to derive truth seems as ancient as the Greeks to modern audiences, for Al-Kindi and his community, deduction was a novel curiosity. Despite its novelty, Al-Kindi saw promise in the wisdom of the Greeks, co-opting their principles in a medieval Islamic context to maintain and consolidate his faith in the divinity of Islamic scripture and revelation, chiefly the Qur'an and the traditions of the Prophet Muhammad. Doing so, Al-Kindi became one of the first thinkers we know of to articulate a balance or harmony between rationalism and faith, vehemently rejecting pure rationalists who saw faith as a useless item, as well as lambasting those who denied any form of knowledge outside of revelation. In his mind, only the combination of these two approaches could lead to true enlightenment, beyond the comfort of blind dogma or the hubris of loose speculation. For him, while prophets and messengers were miraculously bestowed with the truth from above, philosophers had to put in mental effort and use their own intellect to achieve the same clarity. Indeed, Al-Kindi overwhelmingly appealed to the rational sensibilities of his audience, especially when exploring theological matters such as prophethood attempting to systematically prove the Prophet's claims of divinity and challenging, through rational argumentation, all those who opposed it. One notable text of his work being the refutation of the arguments of atheists.
Al-Qindi wasn't merely a man in the Arabian world translating and applying Greek philosophical concepts to religious claims. He departed from Aristotle on many issues, the first and perhaps most striking of which being that the universe was not eternal. It was a firmly held belief in the scientific community of the time that the universe simply goes on and on, into infinity with no beginning and no end. However, for Al-Qindi, such a notion was nonsensical. Although metaphysical philosophy was all about the knowledge of reality, in order to understand something, we ought to understand its causes. And for him, something must have caused all of reality to be. And he called this first cause being the One. This idea was inspired by an earlier Greek school of thought known as Neoplatonism. And it was from this one entity that all material beings and objects, through different methods, the planets, animals, trees, people, and the universe itself were formed and came about. Some of these things developed a faculty of reasoning which was evident through the way they move, following systematic, logical methods, obeying the laws of the ultimate lawmaker, God himself. The one in itself could not be called a material body, since, for Al-Kindi, an actual infinity could not exist as an object and merely existed in our minds. He believed that it would take some serious intellectual acrobatics to find and prove that any physical thing, including the universe, has an infinite proportion. The one cannot be destroyed or created, since that would mean it would possess characteristics such as decay and growth, hot or cold, and so on, and these are physical phenomena. The one had to be eternal, simple, necessary, and uncaused. So, if the universe cannot go on forever, this one thing had to have generated it out of nothing and given cause to every physical phenomenon and object that we know of. Al-Kindi was of course, like many at the time and before, already very familiar with the concept of the soul. The soul plays a central theme within the scripture of the religion of Islam, the Quran and the traditions. Just as it was for the ancients, many philosophers in the Muslim world, including the father of Arab philosophy himself, viewed the soul as that entity which not only gave life to our corporeal being, but also held the innate rational, appetitive and passionate faculties. It is the inner dimension of the human being that allows us to think and ponder as well as giving us the need to eat, drink and the desire for the continual survival of our species. The soul is not something that we can hear, touch, smell or even observe. It is a substance which is wholly separate and independent from our physical being and according to Al-Kindi, it certainly outlives our frail and aging corporeal form. Once we die physically, our soul retakes its place in a higher dimension where every reality and object is in its perfect form. This world is merely a shadow of the higher, truer universe. For Al-Kindi, the soul which becomes a slave to its passions and appetites is comparable to a pig, living life engrossed in bodily pleasures. But the soul that masters its rational faculty is compared to that of the king who knows of all of his subjects. The soul is also most active in sleep. When the organs of our rational faculty are not distracted by our outer sense, the soul gets to work. Conforming with Al-Kindi's view, the soul is then able to conjure up extremely intriguing figures and a plethora of abstract images. Sometimes, the soul becomes so active while our body rests that it can manipulate particular representations of things and events, and thus foretell the future. Al-Kindi took this idea to his theological works as well, viewing this phenomena as being divinely conferred upon religious prophets, which allowed them to prophesy vividly and truly. Al-Kindi was one of the first, if not the first philosopher from the Islamic tradition to engage with Greek ideas. Al-Kindi started a tradition based on the pursuit of pure knowledge, which extends to the modern day. Through the translating of major Greek philosophical texts, Al-Kindi's respect for Greek thought, especially Aristotle, led him to maintain the position that the validity of knowledge shouldn't be affected by its geopolitical source. The Kindian tradition was born out of the engagement of Muslim theological questions fused with Greek ideas, which manifested in his students and the knowledge tradition of the Muslim world. Although Al-Kindi's work was overshadowed and even criticized by later philosophers such as Al-Farabi and Ibn Sina, and was more popular outside of Baghdad, his legacy and influence in bridging Islamic and secular thought was a cause for intellectual joy. Perhaps a joy that has unfortunately faded away today. Al-Kindi's memory remains in the quest for pure truth and knowledge. <laughs>